Hello, hi. Uh, I'm Dr. Ndilman Gurung, and this is the first YouTube video that I'm uh, trying to make. Uh, I'm doing a presentation on MR site journey. I hope people who are preparing for MR site find this video helpful. Let me begin with that slide. And uh, I would expect that you know, if people have any uh, questions and query, please put something in the chat box or in the comment below so i might be able to you know uh, um, give answers to those query okay so let me begin my slides i've got uh, 42 slides and hope in the presentation you know uh, i might be able to make it uh, as informal as possible not to be very you know javanistic and keep on repeating whatever there is in the slides and by the way, I'm Dr. Guru. Uh, I've done my MR Psych exam. I've done my core training, and currently I am uh, ST4 trainee. I know that uh, this was my situation when I started my CT1 in psychiatry. Uh, when I tried to prepare for MR Psych, you know, there were a lot of things that was going inside my head. So this picture tries to uh, show, you know, my confusion when I wanted to start my MR psych exam. I was lost, confused, unsure, unclear, perplexed, disoriented and bewandered. So these are all the things that were in my mind. Okay, so let us go to <coughs> what is MR psych exam. Uh, MR psych exam basically is uh, post nominal qualification. This is mandated by Royal College of Psychiatry. This exam uh, and prefer um, you know most of uh, the psychiatry training in UK they tend to complete during their co-training years and it is expected once you go to ST4 uh, you complete all of your MRSI exam so from 2015 you know uh, previously uh, the time when I started to prepare for MRSI we had three papers in theory but from 2015 it has been reduced to two papers which is paper A, B and the cost exam. Okay and these are some facts <coughs> if people who are preparing for MRSI if they know it it's always good. Okay so the day when you pass your first paper you have got the validity of an exam for four years and five months. Um, in some cases I've seen that cases were you know because of um, paternal leave, uh, employment issues, or for physical health, and this time frame can be further extended to one year. Okay, from October 2014, uh, people who have passed the exam, MSI exam, they are expected to complete the remaining part of uh, training within seven years to get a CCT. In terms of attempt for MSI exam from the 1st of January 2015, there's only six maximum attempt that you can give uh, for exam. Um, one interesting fact, uh, from this year, 22 June 2020, um, um, the exam has been more uh, like online kind of exam, which is also good in the sense that you, know, you don't have to switch. Uh, not spend much money and time effort you know just to book an hotel uh, to the place where you have got the exam setting hopefully you know the presentation that I'm doing today um, is almost let us say uh, 29 of December 30 December and I'm doing this presentation at 2 in the morning uh, just to check with the new technology uh, hopefully by January um, next week that is next week uh, this will be further, you know, reviewed. From 1st of January 2020, um, in a year, you are only expected to give uh, two attempts. I think this is also fair in the sense that you know, in the past, people, before all of this COVID happened, they used to um, give an exam over there, and in some cases, they used to go to countries like Singapore and Hong Kong, where the class is also arranged, and they could have given like three or four ten, four attempts uh, from but from first of January you can only give two attempts per year before you give your cask uh, this is one of the things that you have to satisfy you need to have at least 24 months of whole time equivalent uh, foundation or intensive training in psychiatry by the time when you sit your cask 
Uh, minimum of four months, regardless of the number of weeks, needs to be, and you are expected to work 50% of the five sessions a week. Um, and it needs to be verified by your sponsor. If you look at the dates and the fee, it's quite expensive. Uh, PMT means people who have registered themselves in the Royal College of Psychiatry as an affiliated member. Uh, the price is a little bit cheaper if you compare for paper A, B and cask. I'm just going to leave this uh, screen for a bit of time for people, you know, just to go through the screen of the cost. Um, in the world of giving exam, it seems that, you know, the price uh, cost half of the salary, like especially if you look at the cost section, it's quite expensive. Okay. Um, in this presentation, what I've tried to do is, you know, um, I've tried to give uh, put a lot of pictures so you know just for a motivation as well as people who are preparing you know it also give them uh, to show my journey what I went through while preparing for the exam so uh, basically you know I've given a, a bit of information about uh, the general idea of an MRSI exam and now I'm going to uh, take you through my journey when I prepared for this MRSI exam so you can see this road you know it was a long way uh, okay, when you talk about exam, you know, uh, most of the people only uh, see the top part of uh, the, this picture, success. You know, once you pass an exam, you know, nobody remembers how much hard work, perseverance, late night, re rejection, sacrifice, discipline, criticism, doubts, failures and risk you have to go through while giving this exam. But the main thing is success. Uh, the bottom line for this picture you can take is you can only need to pass exam once but you can even fail exams like five times okay and when you prepare for this exam well, one of the things that you know as personally I have experienced is um, you have got your family life work you know a lot of social stresses and this despite of all of this when you prepare for an exam you know you need to be very focused um, as I said before, you know, uh, balance is very important. Balance can be life needs to go on despite the exam. You need to keep up healthy, keep on doing some exercises, even if it's like work. But I think this might be difficult during the COVID time. But um, I don't see any reason why you can't do one hour an exercise. Uh, keep on um, seeing friends, give yourself to time to relax. Um, you need you need to keep an exam hat because exam is an artificial environment. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed while giving for this exam is, you know, there are a lot of trainees who are really good in the work, and I wonder, you know, so, sometimes they keep on failing, and they have got this doubt inside their mind, like, why I keep on failing exam? Um, but, you know, this might be one of the re reasons why. When you prepare for MRSI, you know, one of the most important things that I've learned during the experience is no matter how good you are in your clinical work exam is an artificial environment so you need to give an exam hat when you prepare for an exam um, okay so let us move to the next slide I hope you know people who are looking at this in videos uh, might be following me and uh, I hope I'm making things easier uh, and I hope people you know, might not struggle to um, know my accent. Okay, so a lot of positive healing thoughts and positive vibes is needed when you prepare for exam. So the first part I've done the basics of an MRSI exam. So in the next, you know, part what I'm going to focus on is I'm going to give um, a bit of you know a uh, bit of information on paper A and B. On side by side, I'm also going to you know share my experience, what I went through, what preparing for paper A and B. After I discuss a bit more on um, the theory side, I'm going to give a pause. Then I'm going to share my experience how I prepared for my task. Okay, hope people are following this. So um, as I said before, uh, for MRSI, you know, there's the theoretical side. Uh, where is this paper A and B? Uh, in the past, before 2015, I think 2015 there used to be 200 questions, but uh, now it's 150 questions. So, um, by the looks of it, you know, the MRSI has been 
um, rural components of psychiatry have been very lenient to us you know imagine when you have to do 200 cushion in three hours you know the time was like a ticking bomb and you know people uh, do struggle did, did uh, struggle to finish you know 200 cushion in three hours but now it's just 150 cushion so i hope you know people who are given this exam might not struggle with the time in the paper two thirds of the cushions that is out of 150 100 question is a single question that means that you know there will be one question and five option um, the 50 of the questions will be extended question that means that there will be a long uh, you know options given like uh, 12 15 options and there will be three questions and uh, um, you know in some of the cases they will ask you know which uh, choose among the two which you know fits this uh, okay um, as I mentioned before, MCQs, they might be best of five you have to answer. Uh, an EMI, which I've already explained. When you prepare for the exam, the most important thing I felt while my own experience is when you prepare for an exam, you need to be very uh, knowledgeable about the syllabus that you have to cover. You know, if you put your syllabus in front of you uh, and prepare for an exam, you make sure that you know you cover everything that comes in an exam okay this is one of the sample question which i put the question is patient tells you that he can hear his neighbor talking whenever he turns the tap on which of the following is he experiencing uh, so let uh, you know let, let us keep ourselves in the exam mode okay so these are the options that we have we have got five options that are extracampic hallucination functional hallucination hypogopic hallucination uh, paradolic illusions and uh, reflex hallucination. Okay, we have about five options. Mm, I'm going to give you, you know, uh, keep a pause of one minute so the uh, people who are looking at this video might have a chance to, you know, uh, um, brainstorm and think, okay, what might be the possible answers for this question. So there's a pause of like 30 seconds I'm going to give. I found it a bit weird, you know, uh, it seems like in the video that I'm talking, I'm just talking with the desktop. I fall uh, beneath the people who are watching this video are following uh, what I'm trying to, you know, convey the message. Okay, so let us. So uh, normally if this was an exam in my, in, uh, you know, exam, uh, the thought process that might be going inside my head is okay. So let us, uh, I'll try, uh, let us try to exclude which are not the options. Okay, so this is and this would be my general option. The first order is illusion, and that is no mention of sleep and must not look at normal experience. So uh, you know if you are uh, if you are trying to look for different options, uh, if it is not hypo uh, hypo hypno compic that is waking from the sleep. So the two of the options that we can uh, easily exclude from this one. Uh, option D, which is paradoxical illusion. Illusion is something like misinterpretations of uh, external stimuli for example like if i'm going and I, I'm, and I'm about to catch a train you know sometime i might uh, you know because of the time frame i might see this you know for example if it's written london instead of seeing london i might see a different like reading okay that might be an illusion and the external stimuli is there but it's just a misinterpretation so in this case you know there's an actual stimuli we can hear the neighbor and tap. It doesn't look like there's a misinterpretation of the so illusion, paradox illusion is excluded. There's no any mention of sleep, so uh, by default, C and D option is excluded. So we have got uh, three options A, B, and E. Okay. It's not outside the sensory stimuli limit. So when we talk about extracampic hallucination, this is an hallucination which is, you know, beyond our uh, beyond our sensory. For example, not in, for example, um, when I'm giving this teaching, it's not like inside the room. It might be outside, like uh, outside the country or you know, beyond my external reach. So that consists of extracampic hallucination. So by default, we have excluded B, A, D and uh, C so only two options we have is B and E 
okay then let us think logically okay so uh, there are two different things happening hearing of a tap running and hearing the neighbor talking both are in the same modality and that is auditory okay hearing so the the option most likely seems to be functional hallucination uh, so let us also try to know what is reflex reflex is something like you know it occurs in a different uh, sensory modality for example if I'm seeing for example if I'm seeing a running tap and if I'm seeing a person that occurs in two different modality that seems to be more of a reflex hallucination than a functional hallucination I hope I'm making <laughs> sense uh, two o'clock in the morning okay. so uh, the most sensible option seems to be functional hallucination um, so what I'm trying to uh, you know so from this example is when you're doing an MCQs you know um, uh, if you also uh, are able to know why the other options are not the correct options you might be learning like five MCQs uh, in one MCQs okay. so paper A okay for paper A uh, normally um, I found it very helpful to divide into two parts basic neurology clinical pharmacology on one side that covers at least half of the paper A the other option that we have is behavior science, social culture, psychiatry, human development, classification, assessment, and psychiatry. Um, when I give paper A, you know, topics like neuroscience and neuro uh, uh, psychopharmacology, they are very straightforward. For example, if they ask you where, uh, for example, where is the fair uh, site located, amygdala, uh, you know, like so, um, the site uh, it's more like a map. You know, you need to know the location, anatomy, and site. So you cannot go wrong if you are attempting any question with neuroscience. Uh, it's similar with uh, psychopharmacology. You know, like if you know the site of receptors and this and that, you cannot go wrong. So those, uh, you know, topics like neuroscience and this are really more of the facts. So as long as you cover, you know, I, mean, I think if you cover very well, uh, you can really score very high on those topics. Uh, and others like you know uh, human development classification of psychiatry i'm going to discuss about you know which are the source materials that i've studied but the thing is in your exam you know if you focus equally on all of these five uh, topics the chances are you are going to uh, score average on each of this so imagine like in the, in the past mark is like 65 if you score average on all the five topics you might be scoring like uh, 64.2 and by failing you know exam by 0 0.4 0 0.5 you know so what I have uh, uh, from my experience I can tell is you know rather than focusing equally on five topics it's good to focus on two or three topics so you score very high and on average you pull up any pass. for paper B um, this was the approach uh, I found it very helpful and uh, uh, for paper B, uh, I would advise you know, just to divide it in three parts. The three parts is, for example, the general adult. When you prepare for paper A and when you pass your paper A, most of the topics will be uh, just a repetition in general order, which covers 40 out of 150. Okay. Um, for the rest of the topic, uh, what I felt helpful is there are six topics. Or the six topics, you know, if uh, if you learn old age and psychotherapy, which is twenty uh, camps and learning disability, which is twenty substance and forensic, which is twenty. So you know, like when you, when you group the topics, it becomes easier, and some of the question might be repetition. From my experience, you know, one of the topics that uh, trainees especially do struggle is critical appraisal, which covers of uh, fifty, which is one third of the question. Um, I did struggle with the critical appraisal when I gave my paper B. Uh, so the uh, the thing that you know uh, uh, I didn't pass my paper B on my first attempt. Uh, but what I've learned from my failed attempt is, uh, you know, the syllabus is very good to follow what is in the syllabus. And depending on the syllabus, you know, you have to cover each part. Um, if you cover all the part of the syllabus then it becomes easier you know your base and foundation becomes very strong and you can clearly attempt uh, the MCQs okay 
so I've given you a basic information about paper A and B. Okay, you now coming to the part that you know you, you as a trainee have to work on is how to prepare for exam. Basically, there are two approaches that you can um, you know adapt in order to prepare for an exam. One is to read the theory and build your foundation. If you build your foundation, then it becomes really you know, easier to attempt the question and answer. And uh, you know, base your revision on repeating repeating the question. Okay, so that is one of the approach which I found it very helpful. Like for people, like uh, for me, you know. Um, I hadn't done any psychiatry training outside UK, so uh, in UK it was my first experience. I did a trust grade before going to my CT, so um, what I felt was my base on the theoretical knowledge was not up to the standard. So that approach, the first support we, we, which I have given in the slides, you know, I found it very helpful. But people, you know, who have got a lot of experience uh, before coming to UK, especially international graduate who have done, you know, master degree, they might find the other approach very uh, helpful. That is, like, you know, attempting a question and then reading the uh, question and doing as many MCQs as possible. They find it helpful. But either way, you know, it depends on which approach you are flexible. You can use on either approach. Approach. Uh, um, the other thing is, you know, like when you do a clinical work, it's also good to look for the connections and the link. And each time when you revise, try to fill up the gap and the knowledge, and work on on your question and answer. And uh, the basic trick of passing the exam is recurrent revision. Okay, so the materials for in terms of materials, you know, there might be two approach. One is class based and online. Um, if people who are doing you know uh, trainings uh, like co-training or even like staff grade uh, of this a uh, lot of this MR psych materials are incorporated in the education and you know, on the weekly teaching that they have um, I think uh, this approach has been adopted by the trust just to subsidize the cost of being covered for your study budget uh, there's something called training online which is in the Royal College of Psychiatry people might be might find it very helpful you know like um, senior trainee like us you know we are given an opportunity to you know contribute for training online which is a free kind of online which is in uh, rural college of psychiatry I would clearly advise you know, people who are preparing for the exam if they have got extra time you know they can uh, spend some time in training online it's, it's a very um, helpful site the popular site from which the people prepare is one is MR site mentor uh, the good thing about MR Psych Mentor is it's cheap compared to uh, SPMM. Okay, in MR Psych Mentor, uh, I think the time when I prepared it was only like fifty-five pounds for six months. Uh, it was very good, you know, in terms of um, building the base. It covers. I think it had it had almost like two thousand two thousand five hundred questions, and it took me a long time, to, you know, just to cover it up. The most popular among is SPMM notes. Um, in the past, there used to be a super ego cafe, which was really good for paper B, preparing for critical appraisal. There used to be a Birmingham course and an Oxford course, but you know, uh, recently Birmingham and Oxford course they have not been updated. Um, there's an SPM Birmingham online courses. Um, there's also MMJ online courses. Uh, there used to be a free um, website Trick Cyclist, uh, but it has not been updated. Okay, before I go to the books, you know, one of the things which I also find it helpful is, you know, people who are preparing for exam, they, they might also be a group in Facebook, like, you know, preparation for MS, like paper B or A, um, they can join, and, you know, there are a lot of uh, free resources that they tend to provide, which is very good for exam. Books, there are a lot of books that you can study. Uh, but one of the things that I've noticed from the books is, you know, even after passing an exam, you know, you can always refer to the books. There are plenty of books. Uh, I'm just going to keep this for two minutes, you know. Um, symptoms in the mind, you know, this is very good for people uh, who wanted to know about a psycho, a psycho a psychologist, uh, a psy a psychotherapy, you know, which comes in the paper B, fish filling the psych psychopathology is also very good. Uh, psychopharmacology is still uh, still essential is also very good 
uh, for critical appraisal of this guide to critical appraisal is very good um, there's mostly prescription guidelines by David Taylor uh, recently I think in 2020 there's also mostly guidelines for physical stuff I would highly recommend people if they have got chance you know just to buy it um, there's get through you know if people want to do more MCQs uh, there's get through uh, MSI uh, and it also has got I think six mocks uh, 200 question each for paper A and B um, but if people have time you know they can invest on it uh, one of the things that I would strongly advise you know people who are preparing the exam is the money that you spend in books courses think this as an investment imagine for example you know if you fail the exam uh, the time that you lost the money that you spent um, might be more than you know um, if you could have just spent more money on um, courses and paper and pass the exam you know that could have saved your time but it's up to you know people um, people so I can only give advice but it's up to them to follow or not to follow okay um, this is one of the questions that a lot of you know, the trainees who are prepared for the exam tends to ask me, ask me how do we prepare um, I think you know that people find it useful flashcards uh, test yourself by doing practical problems with the aid of notes and textbook remember you can text yourself anytime anywhere uh, and a anything um, but if you ask my personal uh, opinion what I did was especially for um, papers uh, I read uh, I read a lot of you know, like you know I kept the syllables and I also read the theory notes and I made my own notes uh, because you know like after three uh, and for paper A and B I think three and a half months is, was enough for me what I did was uh, I did like uh, three rounds of you know repeating the question um, the first month I basically took for uh, preparing for theory notes and the second month and the third month basically I did as much MCQs as possible repeating again and again uh, and the last two or three weeks uh, was the time when I spent more on mocks and the theory notes which I have uh, you know had uh, had made it before that was also very helpful while giving exam uh, one of the things that uh, you know which I find very which I would also encourage you know, people who are giving exams is uh, take at least a week off before exam because I think that week gives you an opportunity you know to uh, revise as much as possible and uh, the things that you learn at the last moment or only tends to remain in your mind more than you know the things which you have studied for like three three two or three months before um, and I think it's also my personal experience what I felt was uh, as a human mind you know you only tend to remember things uh, you, you tend to forget and uh, you tend to forget you know like uh, this is a study is done which shows that after one week two weeks and three weeks the retention of knowledge it tends to you tend to lose it okay uh, effective learning intense uh, intelligent curiosity you know just uh, wanting to know more try to connect even in a work experience try to see okay uh, how this is applicable in the theories or the knowledge that you have learned in MSI you know how it, how I can apply in my day to day life there are a number of things but it depends on people you know how they want to do it uh, and for different tra trainees you know who, uh, who are preparing for exam they have got their own exam techniques so I would highly encourage you know just to reflect on your own exam technique okay leave the exam keep a track of a question do not leave any question I think you know I don't have to tell uh, people you know who have given an exam um, do not panic you know um, out of 150 question believe me there might be 10 questions which are very difficult to um, to attempt 30 percent of question will be difficult will be find difficult on sure you know what might be the answer but the basic thing is try to look, use your logic try to exclude which are not the options um, try to attempt all question it's um, computerized marking there's no any negative marking um, I had a chance to you know discuss with people who have recently given exams so what they have said in online kind of thing is there's like uh, they might be 50 50 50 question so you know during um, your online uh, 
giving an exam you might be given a break and it's it sounds to be more uh, you know relaxed uh, compared to going to the exam hall okay so uh, let us do a little bit of pause for 30 seconds and revise what I have you know uh, gone um, and explain about this MRSAC exam so the first part basically I give you the basic knowledge of what is MRSAC exam in the second part what we did is for the paper A and B you know I gave you a little bit of my own experience of how I prepare for MRSAC A and B um, the basic gist from what we have you know uh, done for the last 20 minutes is okay uh, and the basic gist is you know user exam hat and uh, my claim my personal um, uh, my personal experience is when you prepare for especially for your theory exam is imagine you are learning running like a marathon that means that you know in, uh, it depends on how you spend your uh, time you know how you plan how, how much how many hours you are going to study during the week you know you also have to keep in mind that you know most of the people who are preparing for the exam they might be working they have got family commitment so have to you know balance it out uh, when I prepare for an animal psych exam you know the thing that I kept in my mind is okay if it is a week time in a week what I used to do is for example you know a uh, plan I had for like a month before there might be days where I'm covering on call Okay, so in during the on call, I might not be able to spend much time as compared to uh, the normal day. But roughly in a day, I used to study like one hour, one hour, one hour, and especially during the weekend, like two hours, um, just to you know ease my mind or give a break. You know, uh, one of the weekends I used to keep off, so that was also very helpful. So the last part, okay, let us uh, discuss about the task. Cost is a clinical assessment skills and competency, which is the last part of an exam. Okay, so cost is an oxy exam. Um, in the cost what uh, they tend to have as they tend to have two sets of um, stations. So in the morning time, you'll be given like four minutes and uh, to read the instruction and seven minutes to complete the task. In the afternoon, you know, the time will be a bit restricted. You will have 90 seconds and 7 minutes to complete the task. Um, and as far as I'm aware, because of COVID-19, um, the exams are online. Okay, so this is the basic format. If there are 16 stations, and out of the 16 stations to pass an exam, you only need like 12 stations, and you also need to pass an average. So in the basic, you know, if you look at uh, the structure, in the morning time, as I said before, you're given four minutes to read the instruction, seven minutes to complete the task. But in six minutes, you'll be given a warning sign to say, okay, your station is about to finish. So in the morning time, six of the station, most probably will be management station, one will be focus examination, one will be a history station. So that compromise of your eight station. In the afternoon time, you'll have four station focus on the history, uh, four will be focus on examination, uh, two physical examination, two risk assessment. But because of you know being in this exam being online kind of thing, um, it won't be possible for them to give like for example you know CVS which is a chest examination, respiratory examination. But they need to give like a memory test, uh, uh, mini mental state you know sometime uh, frontal lobe test. So you have to be, be you have to be ready to for those stations to might be the risk assessment station so this is the basic example of the uh, cost station which came in, in in i think this came in the october time of this year okay so if you look at the stations it seems like in the morning time you know um, it will the stations will be more like a management station if you look at the afternoon station, most of most of the station will be like history and risk assessment. From my experience, what I've learned is, you know, uh, after my uh, CT training, I took almost like three years of gap to do a staff grade, um, staff grade job. So in the morning time, what I've uh, what I felt, uh, you know, my experience of working as a senior doctor is. 
uh, you feel more confident uh, to give a management station. So uh, people who are given an exam, uh, you know, uh, I would advise that uh, in the morning time, act as if you are a consultant or senior doctor. So uh, the information that you are giving, you feel comfortable to you know relay those information. Um, but uh, in the afternoon, uh, you know, uh, what I, fi I found it very uh, helpful was if you have the curiosity of a junior doctor, then you tend to ask more questions, which might be very helpful if you're doing a history or risk assessment. So your approach will be more detailed. Okay, so okay, so the skills needed, uh, communication. Uh, in the class, they try to check your communication skills. Um, so I'm going to co come later on what the communication skills means. Candidate will be able, so you know uh, in the exam you know yeah, they will test you in a different kind of uh, settings like inpatient setting, outpatient setting, emergency care, hospital liaison, or the situation where the psychiatric assessment might be requested. Uh, one of the approach that I found very helpful while preparing for the course is imagine if you are doing an exam. Uh, you know, visualize yourself, see, uh, seeing yourself in the setting. For example, if it is an inpatient setting, and if you're seeing a patient, you know, imagine, okay, you are in the setting, uh, you are seeing your patient. So you know, it helps to reduce the anxiety when giving this exam. In communication skills, this uh, were this um, you know uh, basic kind of skills that you need in communication, uh, which are taken from the Royal College of Psychiatry. So in terms of, you know, uh, in CASC, um, when I mention about communication skill, that means you have to be organized, structure in consultation, management of a consultation, that means that you need to know how to uh, take in charge of the communication, you know, that, that station. Consultation, if you, it needs to be formal. That means organic, you know, it's not like you have learned certain phrases and, you know, it comes, um, it looks very odd if it comes more of like uh, you are s stretching, you know, and you are forcing the communication. You need to be natural. You need to feel in your skin when you give this exam. Okay, so proper attitude and behavior. The other thing is listening skills. For example, uh, you need to give a space for the actor in front of you to talk, and also acknowledge that you know you have listened. Um, Clues. You have to pick up the clues. For example, there was a station when I prepare, when I gave my exam, like a depressive station where a patient had a big kind of stain on the dress. Um, so that was the station. A seventy-year-old uh, lady, you know, so the station was basically you know explored the history. Um, the clue was in the dress. So from the dress, you know, I was able to find out, okay, the lady might be suffering from depressive symptoms. So I was very curious to explore all of this. Good questioning style means um, every trainee who are giving this exam, you know, they have got their own style of taking interview. So you have to stick with your own kind of interview. Uh, good use of language in context of scenarios. So yeah, uh, that also comes in communication skills. Um, my advice is, you know, uh, different trainees have got their own style of interview. For example, if I reflect on my own style of interview, you know, uh, I'm a trainee who feels very comfortable to use my body language and uh, my hand skills as well, and just to show that. So these are my positive uh, things which I can take for my task or even in my day-to-day -day practice. Uh, one of the things, you know, the drawback when I reflect of myself, one of the things that I can see is I'm not a very expressive person, but that also, you know, I am, um, for that, to compensate that, I have learned how to modulate my voice. So you have to, you know, basically know your strength and as well as your weakness and have to, you know, come up with the best idea to demonstrate your communication skill. Okay, when you are taking in history, uh, Recognize the significance aspect of the history, presence and explore detailed relevant symptoms, adequate skills in risk assessment, sufficient attempts to uh, identify uh, appropriate psychological and social information. Okay, I put a lot of things of that. Uh, but the basic thing is when you're taking history, what I've learned through my experience as well as, you know, which I found it very helpful while giving exam, for, especially for class is when you're taking history, it needs to have a starting 
a middle point and end. No, it doesn't. Um, it needs to be structured. The bottom line is it needs to be structured. So you know, like when you are exploring the history, it just become like a curious, more like a detective. Um, so you know, your history uh, might be more organized and structured. In terms of management, you know, you need to formulate the problem efficiently, okay, recognize the significance of finding and result, educate management, reflect on the current practice. Uh, also, you know, um, in management, uh, I think it's always good to ask about idea, expectations, um, so um, it helps to, you know, balance it out um, when you make a plan. Adequate risk management is very important. Um, when you explore about the risk, it's not about you know uh, have you got any thoughts to harm yourself, harm other people. When you talk about risk, you know it, it needs to be multi. It needs to cover uh, different parts like vulnerabilities, as well as you know whether this patient is safe to be discharged in home. Uh, and you also need to explore uh, medical, psychological, and social intervention, which is a biosocial model. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, try to correlate my experience of cost okay um, and uh, since i've been doing a middle grade for almost like three years um, you know the in the basic like uh, cost station for example like station where a patient tried to hang himself uh, okay actor actor uh, you know like at the end of you when you take all the history and management plan for example if the patient says okay uh, uh, not uh, uh, I want to kill myself for this and that you know um, I, I think the safer approach would be uh, just to say that you know from the history I've taken you know I'm really concerned about you whether uh, you need any extra support this and that uh, and depending on the scenarios you know you have to adapt yourself I, I don't think you know uh, you will feel even if you um, mention about uh, for example like uh, uh, we think that you need to come to the hospital and for you know, if you uh, from your uh, assessment if you find out that you know the patient lacks the inside and the risks are high I don't think you know you'd fail e even if you I think you might get a bonus point for saying that you know uh, we might request for a mental health assessment so it looks you know just to make sure that you have a safer doctor okay this is the slide that I like out of all the uh, all of the slides that I have uh, prepared. Okay. Uh, so I would prefer to call as a cognitive destruction. You know, people who have uh, given this exam before, uh, they might complain that this exam is not fair, like cultural difference, English not my first language, unpredictable exam, pass rate not promising. Um, uh, and you know, uh, with cognitive distortion, I think the thing is, uh, they try to make an excuse, and with the excuse, you know, uh, the growth stops. So instead of doing that, uh, what I highly encourage you know, people who are giving exam, not only just MRSAC exam, like JP exam or any exams in life, uh, I think this uh, this approach seems to be more favorable than having cognitive distortion that is designed to push yourself, best to do in the rise up, challenge, do as you can, uh, keep uh, perseverance. Perseverance is a very, uh, very important skill if you want to adapt to as, as well as grow yourself. Motivate yourself and the thing is, you only need to pass once, you can even fail five times. Um, I think it's more of a mental game, which I find, uh, which uh, you know, from the slide I want to demonstrate to people who are giving the exam. Uh, focus on what you can control, rather than focus on that you cannot control. Uh, let us take an example of this COVID. You know, you cannot control the amount of toilet paper at your store, how long it's going to last, how others are going to react, uh, predict. You can only co uh, control your positive attitude, turning on the news and this and that. Uh, on this slide, I also want to highlight, you know, there's a difference between opinion and facts. People might have a lot of opinions on you if you don't uh, pass the exam or, you know, if you fail in, a, uh, in your life. But consider that, okay, if people have those opinions, you know, those are not facts, okay. Um, I think it's good to focus on facts rather than relying on opinion. For course, there are a number of books that I would highly recommend. Pass the course by... Uh, Modilia, yeah, she also has all the online courses. Uh, you know, people who are preparing for exam, I would highly recommend to use that. 
uh, how to pass MRSI. So there are a lot of other books like Get Through uh, MRSI Passing the Cars. SPMM videos are also very helpful. Um, the other courses are cognitive uh, cognition course, this skill for cars, Oxford course, and the trust also organized cars mocks and interview skills. Um, people can use a lot of resources for preparing for cars. Uh, if you ask my personal opinion, um, I went through all of the books. I also added a number of courses like SPMM, Oxford, Skill Forecast. Uh, one of the things that really helped me was, you know, uh, you can also be an actor to practice. That, that was the thing that really helped, was helpful for me. The other thing is, within a trust, you might find a number of people who are giving exam, you know, just try to... Um, make a group in WhatsApp group, you know, and try to practice with certain uh, people who are giving exam. Uh, and people who have just joined a psychiatry trainee, there's a book called uh, Psychiatry Breaking the Ice Introduction Common Task Emergency for Trainees. This book is very good. Okay, so this I have already explained. Try to find someone to regularly practice. It's also good to seek help from you know people who have just passed exam, like ST fours, as well as you know senior doctors, uh, and uh, get feedback from them. In rural areas, uh, you can use Skype. Uh, okay, finding the machines and train your body to recognize what seven minutes fill time and practice early as possible. On the day of an exam. Uh, let the role player sit in and uh, uh, control the station, summarize, double check, listen clue, address the anxiety. Don't be afraid to answer a question. Be careful not to double question. That means, like, for example, in a station, you cannot ask, okay, um, do you drink alcohol? Do you take drugs? In those kind of scenarios, the actor might be just reluctant to give one answer and you might be missing the other one, okay? Keep a positive attitude. You only need to pass 12 out of 16. So even in some of the station that you miss, you know, you don't keep that and take that negative vibe to the next station. I passed my course uh, in my second attempt, in my first attempt, I think. Uh, let me share you my experience. Uh, in the morning, you know, um, uh, when I got my feedback, I passed all the seven station. There was one station uh, that really stuck to my mind. For example, there was a station of a meningioma. Um, so in that station, uh, the, um, my task was basically to speak with the um, daughter to explain what is meningioma and the treatment and I was clueless you know um, I didn't know anything about meningioma and uh, I was just trying to hit around the bushes and uh, I knew that I missed the station so after that you know there was a break of like two or three hours and during the time you know this station uh, kept on just ruminating on my head so when I started the afternoon station, um, the four of the station that were in the afternoon, I was basically thinking of the station, and I missed the four, four of the station in the afternoon time. And by the time when I got hold of my nerves, you know, I passed the remaining of the station. So um, from that experience, one first class, I passed the eleventh station. I got more than an average. But what I've learned uh, from the experience is, you no, know, no matter what, even if you make a blunder, you know, not to take that. Uh, um, and emotions to the next station. You only need 12 station to pass the exam. Hope that experience might be helpful for people. Okay, after exam, basic advice is not to think too much. Exam is over, and I don't think I need to give more advice. Don't dwell on it. Um, the chances are the pr there's a process of selective abstraction and uh, arbitrary inference that you only tend to remember what you have done wrong and forget what you have done right. Uh, wait for the result. Hope you pass. If you don't pass, don't be too hard on yourself. Make uh, there are many people who receive the exam like me also. You know I, I didn't pass any of the exam on my first attempt. Um, so you might feel at the end to seeing that uh, you know your colleague passed, but it's not an end of world. Keep on trying. Uh, Okay, final message is uh, okay. Uh, if if you don't pass an exam, try to get a feedback and see how you can improve next time. Uh, the basic mentality that I have is if I don't pass an exam, just think that you have given an expensive mock, and you know the real exam is next time. Uh, when you prepare for, especially for an exam, you know just uh, I think 
just to build up your confidence i think uh, having a bit of necessity also helps especially in the cost like you know just have a mentality that i am one of the best doctor so this approach also helped me hope it helps people who are giving this exam uh, tackle more difficult area first rather than revising area you are good at so you know don't just focus on the good area also uh, try to tackle the difficult area the final message is celebrate take time off from your holiday just to get your energy back hope uh, I'm rambling for almost like 30 30 to 35 and 2 in the morning and it's all uh, already like 2 uh, 35 in the morning I hope uh, people find this presentation helpful if you have got any question please and do drop in our comments um, this might be my first video in YouTube uh, okay so I've done my presentation and it's the end of it so just want to say morning thank you very much uh, and this is my first YouTube video and which I've started in 2 in the morning and I have finished at 2.35 hope everybody have a um, good new year happy new year thank you very much